Please welcome our panellists, Chief Executive Officer of LinkedIn, Ryan Roslansky. President and Chief Executive Officer of PayPal, Dan Schulman. Managing Director and Vice Chairman of PIMCO, John Studzinski. And our moderator, anchor for Bloomberg Television, Haslinda Amin. Thank you for joining us. We've heard of the great resignation and started in the US, is now firmly in Asia. Multiple industries are finding it hard to find talent. We've also heard of the quiet quitters. Gallup says that 75% of American workers are disengaged, and that's all prompting critical conversations on the future of work, the future of workers, how do you hire the best talent, how do you retain them, is there a perfect model? Okay, forget about perfect, but is there a good model? Let's start with Ryan. You know, you have access to massive data, right? Almost 900 million, or is it billion? No, uh -huh. 900 wow. million <laughs> members, six, 60 million companies. I mean, when you take a look at your data, what's coming through in terms of how workers have changed, workers' expectations have changed, um, you know, after three years of reflection over COVID? Yeah, I mean, you know, to your point, there's uh, a lot of change and uncertainty right now in the world. And, you know, we're thankful to have the LinkedIn graph, which to your point has roughly 875 million members, uh, not billion, uh, currently <laughs> one day we'll, we'll have that. Um, uh, at any given time, there's, you know, 15 million jobs posted. So it just creates a lot of great data. The graph updates roughly 5 million times per minute with awesome insights about what's happening across the global labor market. I think there's a couple of things that are really interesting right now to pay attention to. Number one, we track a stat which is called position changes. Quite simply, on your LinkedIn profile, you decide to move from one company to another company. That's a position change. And historically, across the LinkedIn data, the year-over-year -year change in that number is fairly flat, maybe up a percent or two uh, every year, but a fairly stable number. That number dropped radically when COVID started, which makes sense. People were not moving jobs. They were sheltering in place to try and figure out the uncertainty. Then that number shot up. It shot up north of 100% year over year as the pandemic started to subside. That's what we talk about is the great reshuffle, the great resignation. My goodness, was that real? You all probably felt it inside of your companies. Uh, but right now, that number is actually coming back down in the normal levels. So the labor market's starting to settle back to where it was pre-pandemic in terms of job changes, except for one demographic, and that's Gen Z. Gen Z is still moving at an unprecedented rate, and I think that this is a generation that actually believes it's okay to move around frequently uh, and needs to be constantly motivated and inspired. So the great reshuffle is coming down. Number two, pre-pandemic, roughly 1% of all jobs on LinkedIn posted were remote jobs. Today, that number is about 15% of, uh, of all jobs, of 15 million jobs, 15% are remote. However, north of 50% of all job applications on LinkedIn are going to that 15% of remote jobs. So there's a lot of demand from job seekers still around remote work. I think the last interesting stat that I would call out, uh, it's fascinating. I was uh, fortunate to be at a, a conference about a month ago with Microsoft CEO Satya Nadella looking at some data that we ran across the Microsoft and LinkedIn graphs that shows that 85% of all managers right now believe that in a hybrid world, their employees are not being productive. On the flip side, 87% of all employees believe they're being extremely productive or actually being burnt out. It's what we call this productivity paranoia. So I just think it represents uh, another management and leadership challenge for everyone right now to try and figure out what the next steps of their companies are gonna look like and how to navigate through a world that was different than it was three years ago. Dan, how are you assessing the changes? Is it a recalibration? I mean, the last three years have been massive upheaval. I mean, we went from having 57 offices right before the pandemic around the world, you know, to having 30,000 around the world because everybody, uh, you know, had to work from home. We had to adjust to that. Uh, reality. We put in productivity tools. We measured different ways of thinking about productivity. Then we come out of the pandemic and go into 
some of the worst geopolitical and economic conditions we've seen in the last 30 or 40 years. So there really hasn't been a, a, you know, a, a normal uh, over the last uh, several years. And I think Ryan's exactly right. I, this whole thing around great resignation, I think it was really kind of you know, great pent up. Man, nobody resigned during the pandemic at all. You had attrition rates at all time record lows. They shot up post the pandemic as people looked for opportunities. They may not have been happy where they were and they've come back down uh, again. I do think now we are really trying to figure out what is the new normal for work in a very difficult environment um, as well. And I think that is still um, evolving. I will say though, and, and I'm gonna bet that all of us on this panel would agree that we have a lot of constituencies that we need to satisfy as leaders of companies from our customers to regulators, um, to our shareholders, to our employees. But the number one most important constituency that we all have is our employees. I mean, the strength of our employees, the passion of our employees, the diversity of our employees is what will determine our success going forward. So thinking about how you attract the very brightest, maintain the very brightest, uh, and motivate them uh, behind what you're doing is job number one for all of us. We tend to use the pandemic as the starting point, but it started way before that, because when Google did a project, Aristotle project by 2016, it found that to get the best out of your employees, it is about psychological safety. They need to feel safe in that environment. It's not about you know, compliance to rules and regulations at work. Talk to us about what you're seeing in terms of those changes in the financial industry. It's a perfect question because we are, we're now, we've been subject to so many shocks over the last three or four years, and this is actually the shock for the workforce. And prior to COVID, there was a big focus on how do you nurture, how do you respect, respect in the workplace, human capital, motivating, training, engaging. And I think what this has done is it's almost underscored the fact that people want to be part of a community. People want to be part. It's defining how you structure that community, whether, it, whether it's on Zoom, whether it's remote, or whether it's in person. And I, I think the reality is COVID has given us um, a wake-up call that with, with the advent onset of artificial intelligence and a number of other things that are going to transpire over the next three, four, five, ten years, we've got to go back to the basics that people are interested. So much of our business, which is either trading floors or engaging with clients on a real-time basis, require collaboration and creativity. And that has to be in a real-time mode where you understand what's going on. It's not something that can happen over a period of time. So in financial services, and I think this conversation, you've got to really look at it industry by industry, culture by culture, and also demographic as well. But it does come down to nurturing dignity in the workplace. And I think how you define the future workplace and how you keep dignity in work is important. Against this backdrop of a recalibration, Dan, are you finding it hard to find talent? Always. No. Always. I mean, it everyone, what everyone wants to work for you. Yeah. Come on. <laughs> uh, a lot do, but finding the right talent uh, in a competitive marketplace, it depends on what the, what the job function is. Like, you know, platform, software, uh, engineers. UX. I mean, those are those are diff hard jobs to find, and uh, and you pay well uh, to get those jobs. I, I think the key to attracting people, though, I, I think it's probably twofold. One is having a, a mission and a set of values that people believe in, really believe in, um, not something that's just on a wall that could be anybody's mission or set of values. But something that you 
that you embrace, you act on, your products uh, also uh, uh, have that same sensibility within them. And um, so that, that's number one. Number two is that we think about our employees holistically. Um, we think about not just their physical health, which really came to the fore with the pandemic, but then what also came to the fore in the pandemic was their mental health. It, people were stressed out, um, and people are still stressed out. I mean, you're going into you know, a lot of layoffs in the tech, and people are stressed out about that, and mental health is very important. Mm -hmm. and, and the final thing is their financial health. Like, how do you measure somebody's financial health? How do you make sure that you are assuring that they have a living wage, that you're actually measuring whether they have that, and not just saying, well, I'm paying you know, $18 an hour or $20, but like, after all of their living expenses, like, how much money do they have left over? Um, and uh, make sure that you understand that and that you support their financial health. And I think those things together, understanding the totality of, of the human, um, making sure that you have an inspiring mission and vision, and, and then just creating community inside the company. And that does attract a lot of people. And you know, our attrition rates are below industry average. I think a lot of it has to do with that. What would that be, the attrition rate? Well, attrition rates in the tech industry can be anywhere from like 18 to 20 percent. Uh, you know, we're much lower than that. Um, 10? Well, we're, we're probably somewhere around 12 uh, right now. And so um, much lower. Um, but a lot, we spent a lot of time thinking about that, too. I think it's, as I mentioned, I think our only sus sustainable competitive advantage is the strength of our employees. Mm. I think there's going to be greater, it follows well with what Dan has alluded to, this young people, particularly the youngest generation. Um, when I joined Morgan Stanley 40 years ago out of, out of business school, I sort of paid a bit of attention to corporate culture. You sort of glean that when you're in the interview. But now, I mentor a lot of young people, and the first thing when they're talking about moving jobs, I say, what is the culture of the firm you're going to? Have you interviewed people on the culture? What does the culture stand for? Does it, is it a quantitative culture? Is it a qualitative culture? Does it have a lot of human interaction? What are its values? Um, and, if, if, and if you can't summarize a corporate culture's values in two or three succinct points, then they probably don't work at it. And I think one of the things now that's happened is people are very focused on corporate culture because it's, it's incumbent, it's, it's part of the transaction, it's the job. You have a quid pro quo, you join a corporation, you join a community, you join a team, um, it's, you join a family. So it is, culture is very important and I think we don't spend enough time scrutinizing corporate culture. I think one of the reasons that culture is so important right now though is because over the past couple of years, every leader has had to make a couple of very difficult decisions. Do we work remotely, hybridly? Do we require vaccines? A bunch of new decisions about how their company works. And what they're actually doing is redefining who they are as a company, which is redefining their culture and values. We define culture as the collective personality of the organization. It's who we are, more importantly, it's who we aspire to be. And we just went through a process of actually, after you know, the company's 19 years old, redefining our culture and values mm. to be, have a strong foundation for the new world of work, I think, that it's required. I think the other thing on the demand for talent, there's something that, I'm, that I've been paying a lot of attention to, which I think is going to be even more relevant for the next generation than it ever has been. I think companies that are able to operate at the intersection of doing good in the world and doing well in business are going to have a massive competitive advantage moving forward. Every company focuses on doing well in business, and then when you focus on doing good, it's an afterthought. It's the last slide of a PowerPoint presentation. It's the creation of a .org website. But when the product that you build can mm. seamlessly combine doing good and doing well in one thing, I think those companies are going to have massive competitive advantages for talent moving forward. I, I fully agree with that. I think people who think that profit and purpose are at odds with each other mm. are not thinking about it the right way. I think companies with a purpose over at, at a minimum the medium term to long term uh, will be more profitable 
than those without that. And the reason for that is if you don't have a purpose, you will not attract the very best talent. It's, and they will attract quite quickly. And, um, and so I think having a sense of purpose attracts the right people. They are passionate about their work. You don't have to force them to work hard. They want to work hard. Like we, um, when the war broke out in Ukraine, um, there was a real need to get money into, um, into the everyday Ukrainian citizen who may not be anymore in Ukraine, may be a refugee now in uh, adjacent countries. And um, what typically would take us nine to 12 months took us nine days to accomplish because people were so passionate about doing that. And now over the platform, we've been able to send over a billion dollars of aid to, uh, to normal citizens of the Ukraine. It's that kind of thing where your product and the passion and the values all intersect together that you can, you can unleash miracles when that, when that happens. We talk about a lack of talent. Uh, perhaps it's also the way companies hire, the criteria. If you take a look at the future economy, Ryan, I mean, skills, needed will be different. When you take a look at the data you have, what are the skills we should be looking for as, as leaders, as CEOs of companies? I mean, be it due to COVID or digital transformation or a fourth industrial revolution, roles are being created and displaced right now at a record pace. And historically, we've used criteria like where did someone go to school? What was their previous company? Do I know them? Are they in my network uh, as a proxy for whether or not they'd be a good fit? Quite simply because it was easy and we didn't really have a better alternative. But I think that with the pace the world's moving, uh, we need an alternative and more flexible way to uh, assess talent and connect talent. And I think that's going to come from a skills first view of skills being the currency. Here's a really great example. In the middle of the pandemic, we saw two interesting things happen on LinkedIn. One, food service workers, rightfully so, were becoming unemployed very quickly. People weren't going to restaurants, et cetera. So these huge amount of people are out of a job. The most in-demand created job during the pandemic on LinkedIn was digital customer service agents. That makes a lot of sense. People are moving their business online. They need customer service. The average food service worker had 70% of the skills needed for one of those entry-level digital customer service jobs. Mm. But because that's not how the world works, the world thinks, these folks went unemployed and these jobs kept going unfilled. If we can start to change our mentality to make skills the basic currency, we'll be able to solve problems like that in a much more efficient and equitable way across the global labor market. It's, it, it's a good segue. I, in one of my mentoring groups uh, for young people, when they're moving and to your point about the young group wanting to leave, change jobs every one, two, or three, or four years, um, we go through an exercise where they hand me their resume, and I look at their resume, and I say, would you go back and rewrite that resume, take off the job descriptions, and just talk about the skills you use as a percentage of skills per hour, per week, and rewrite this on the basis of what skills you can project. And they come back and they think, my God, I hadn't realized I was so talented that I was good at A, B, and C, because job descriptions don't tell you a thing. But if you talk about skills and a portfolio of skills, you actually do two things. One, you help people better understand themselves, but you also help them re reposition their sense of confidence, which I find from a, in terms of mentoring is very good. Are you hiring differently, Dan? Now yeah. compared to five years yeah. ago, perhaps? Well, of course. Um, I mean, technology is moving so quickly. It's displacing some jobs, creating others. Um, and so you have to hire for that. Also, um, you know, our number one value is um, inclusion. Um, you know, my favorite quote is like, diversity is a fact. Inclusion is a choice. Um, I think those firms that are more diverse uh, are more successful as well. And so we look very hard at the diversity of our workforce, diversity across our leadership ranks, up and including our board. Um, and so um, you have to adapt very quickly right now. I mean, the world is changing 
faster than it ever has. And one thing I say inside the company is, if the pace of change external to us is greater than the pace of change internal, we're probably falling behind. Mm. And that's uncomfortable mm. because it constantly forces you to think about, are you organized the right way? Do you have the right skill sets? Are you, and, um, and people inevitably don't like change. People who win the lottery go through divorces and lose, like you, you'd have to say that, like that was a good positive change. You won the lottery, but, but change mm. really can uh, make people very disoriented, but that is sort of the, uh, the coin of the realm. How quickly can you adapt to change? I want to talk about shifts in work. I mean, there's been a lot of talk about hybrid work, whether it's going to be a three in, two out, four in, one out, permanently out. And when you take a look at the financial industry in particular, it's been quite interesting. I mean, it was three in, two out, and now everybody wants everybody in. Of course, it is industry related. In the end, what would work best for the financial sector? Well, I think... You know, we are an in-office culture. PIMCO is an in-office culture. Um, we're either f f five or, uh, or four one, depending on where in the world one goes. Um, and it's very interesting because the, the young people just out of business school, law school, and university are desperate to be in the office. Because they want to, they want to observe. This sounds awful, but they want to observe people like me in meetings. They want to. They're on a trading floor, particularly when you're learning uh, a skill, and it's market sensitive, where you have to have a community collaboration and creativity. It's happening on a real time basis. That's hard to teach. Um, nuances, subliminal nuances skills, a lot of that you need to learn sort of in person. So financial services, when you're talking about portfolio management, trading, or dealing with clients and advising, those require uh, very much. Uh, so we're very much an in-office culture. Not everyone is, but for the most part, I think Wall Street has taken that approach. Greater flexibility for the tech sector, Dan. What's How do you look at it? There's greater flexibility. Mm. Yeah. Well, I think we look at it slightly differently, but there's a lot, John said, that, uh, that I agree with um, as well. We're more remote than we are in person, and I have not mandated a 3-2, 2-3, 1-4, 97, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like you know, each group needs to... Uh, think about what works best mm. for them. So some meet more frequently in the office and some are predominantly uh, remote. Um, software engineers can be more remote um, and then you know, they come together maybe two days in a month to do you know, what, what are we going to be focused on the next month, but then they can work remotely. They're much more productive, at least uh, that we can measure um, but I do think this, I think during the pandemic, we saw productivity go up quite substantially. But we also hired quite a bit during the pandemic. We're continuing to hire, you know, you lose people through attrition. And all of a sudden, you know, three years later, you have a workforce that has not been together, like a, a good percentage of that. Because in the early days of the pandemic, you know, when I'm on a video call, I know everybody, you know, who's there. I know you know, all my customers, I know the regulators are like, so it's okay to do that, right? We have relationships, we have culture embedded, et cetera. When you're hiring people and you don't know them at all and, and they haven't been a part of your culture and that becomes more of a part of your company, I think there needs to be places where you're coming together and sharing and, and we're continuing to evolve are thinking of that will always be some form of hybrid, but how that, e that is clearly evolving over time. There's a question linked to what we've been discussing. When can we expect companies to impose stronger return to work policies? Could a recession be the catalyst that finally forces most workers back in the office? 
Brian? <laughs> well, I, I'm happy to, uh, nobody knows. It's, but, hard, uh, to, it's hard to generalize. <laughs> yeah. by, it's going to be, again, industry and function specific. Really, it, it's hard to generalize. Yeah, I mean, and both of you guys talked about your policies as it relates to your culture. And this is what we were saying very early on. It used to be kind of everything worked the same way. And now every company, every industry is just defining their culture. And I think that in the short term, there'll be some reshuffling of talent around that as every company figures out the best way they're going to work. But over time, I think that it's going to lead to greater productivity and efficiency because, you know, people align themselves with the types of companies and cultures that they want to work at. And if a company can't be successful with the culture and the policy they have, they'll have to adapt. So I think that's just going to keep changing over time. It's just not that there's one right answer of here's the, here's the way the world will work moving forward. It's going to work in many different ways. And I have found that it's also different again at certain levels. Like my team, we're pretty much back in the office now for the most part, my, my senior team. We have a ton of things to talk about and discuss all the time because, you know, because you're moving into a more difficult economic environment, there are a lot of decisions to be made. There are real-time decisions to be made and we're coming in more. I think as we come in more, more and more people start to come in more um, as well. And so I think just naturally you're seeing things evolve and I think based on the environment uh, and the culture of the company, um, I would bet you're going to see more and more move, more and more people move back into an office environment. But we'll, we will clearly be hybrid for a long time to come. At the end of the day, we're human beings. And I think human beings respond to the human interaction, to a sense of teamwork, community. And uh, I really do believe in my heart of hearts that if you look at we talked about international diplomacy going off the rails in the last two to three years because heads of state couldn't be together. You have a lot of companies now that are rediscovering themselves because people are now for the first time, as Dan was saying, teams are together and they're starting to realize what's great about their culture and how to appreciate it. So I think people respond to the human interaction more and the real challenge is how do you preserve the human interaction once things like artificial intelligence and these other things start to emerge as an important commercial tool. On that upbeat note, <laughs> Ryan, Dan, John, thank you so much for your insights today. Thank, thank you, you for being with us.